Welcome to After the Oil Machine. This is where we discuss the issues raised in the film. As we speak, the film The Oil Machine has been playing in the US. I'm here today with James Mario. James is a writer, activist, artist, and co-author of Crude Britannia. He's a key participant and executive producer of the film The Oil Machine. James, what's the point of showing a film about the British North Sea in America? This is an American problem. It was a problem that was born in America in many ways, and it's a problem whose solution America needs to play a big part on. First of all, the climate crisis has been going through the roof, and every single viewer of this film in the US will be impacted by that. And consequently, their stakeholders also in every single oil and gas field in the world, and also those ones in the UK. What happens in the UK's oil and gas fields will impact the climate, and that will impact American citizens. The other reason why it's an American problem is, particularly American problem, is that the UK uh, oil and gas industry was basically born in America. Britain didn't have much expertise in drilling holes in the seabed offshore, several miles offshore. The place that did have expertise in that was Louisiana, America, southern states. And the southern states took the leading role in the developing of the oil and gas projects in the UK's North Sea. That's not just in terms of the technology, but also in, crucially in terms of the capital. The first... Uh, engineering companies in the southern north sea were american engineering companies the first company to land oil and actually extract it and bring it to shore in the uk was hamilton brothers in 1975 hamilton brothers based in dallas texas these are american companies that started this development here and crucially the uk's oil and gas sector followed the american model Pretty much everywhere in the world in the late 60s and early 70s where there was oil being developed that oil was developed by the state that owned that had the control over that oil so for example in saudi or iran or iraq or libya or all of those countries they the, the state owned the land and largely utilized its own state companies to do it the two places in the world that didn't do that were the US and Canada. The UK could have followed the example of, say, Saudi or Iraq or Iran or all of those, but it didn't. It followed the example of the US. And the consequence of that is, is that it's radically privatized right from day one. It's private capital, not state capital, that drives forward the exploitation of oil and gas in the UK's oil and gas sector. And the consequence of that is that it's private capital that holds the future of this area. It's American capital that holds the future of this area. If we look at a comparable area, Norway, Norway has an oil province and gas province very similar to the UK's, pretty much the same level of production. A few, uh, the fields are larger, there are less of them, but the same output. And the Norwegians followed a completely different model. They followed a model which was state owned using a state oil company, then known as Statoil, now known as Equinor, to develop it. And the consequence is that they have much better labor laws. Women were much more involved in the workforce, and they still are. And the environmental regulations are much tighter. Totally different than what's happening in the UK. A complete difference because they didn't follow the American model. And the, one of the consequences of that is they built up a sovereign wealth fund, which was using money, profits from the oil development to pay for the good of things provided by the state. And they have the biggest sovereign wealth fund in the world now. The British state could have done that. People were pushing for that and it didn't happen. And it's a tragedy. And the reason why it didn't happen is that we were following an American model. And there are good things about that, but there are also very bad things about it. And we are suffering now from the fact that uh, we don't have that sovereign wealth fund and we don't have the best 
welfare system in the in, in, in the, one of the best welfare systems in the world. In fact, we have one of the worst. Can you also see any differences between the UK and the US when it comes to the oil and gas industry? No, I think that the, 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 the thing is that the similarities of the thing that is the case. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned a bit about the history of why we have constructed this situation. But it's worth, also worth looking at the current situation and the future. In the film, we talk about how oil fields are changing, the pattern of ownership in, in oil fields is changing, how some in some parts of the UK sector, there are national companies such as the Chinese, the Iranians, and, and, and coming in and, and, and controlling and uh, buying up their rights and be, having a controlling stake in it. But those state companies are just part of it. The dominant part of it is actually private equity companies. And the private equity companies, that is, they are very, very uh, dramatically US private equity companies. Financial institutions such as BlackRock, which is based in, in New York. There are two or three very large oil companies such as BP and Shell, still involved in the North Sea, although their position is declining and has been, say, in the last 20 years. And BP and Shell are they, they may look like European com uh, companies. BP is British Petroleum, apparently. But actually, if you look inside them, BP is essentially an American company. If you look at the board and the provenance of the board, if you look at where the shareholders live, it's basically an American company with a UK brand on it. So once again, not only in private equity, but also the large oil companies, they have a, f a dominant stake in the UK North Sea, American investors and American companies. What does that mean? Viewers may have read how the UK government wants to carry on. We're looking to develop, say, for example, the Rosebank field, and there's questions around other fields such as Cambo and Teal and so on. And that's what the government wants to do. There are lots of people in civil society who feel that we shouldn't be doing that. And there are lots of people around the world who feel that they shouldn't be doing that. Those stakeholders that I mentioned in the beginning, those people who have a stake in the future of the North Sea because extracting that oil and gas will impact on their lives in terms of floods and wildfires and droughts and so on. All those people, they don't want it to go ahead. And who's the deciding factor here? Who's the biggest player in the game? It's American capital concerns. If American capital concerns say, we don't want to carry on developing the North Sea, it's not going to happen. If the, even if the UK government begs for it to happen, it's not going to happen. And so therefore, the future of this sector is largely being determined in places such as New York and Boston, where that capital is held, and Houston. So James, let's look at what's happening right now in the States. Can you talk us a little bit about that? What's very inspiring is it feels like 30 to 40 years of climate activism is beginning to really bite in the US. It's a remarkable that California, which is the biggest dis, you know, economy outside of the US, the biggest separate bit of the US, uh, of economy in the US, um, has, is taking oil companies to court. It's California is a state which was essentially built on oil. So the fact that the state is actually going to sue oil companies and take them to court about climate impact is really remarkable. Um, and it sets a precedent both in the US, but also globally. And it's a great, powerful signal. On the opposite side, it's a great, it's a pity, a great sadness that the Biden administration has approved the Willow uh, project in Alaska which is similar to the Rosebank project here. It's an oil and gas um, prospect, largely oil, um, which is, has been given a, a, a legal approval by the government machinery here um, to go ahead. Uh, so it's a pity that the Biden administration has done that. It's a great sadness. But the battle is not finished yet on that, I would guess. And also at the same time, the Biden administration has been pushing for a massive investment in renewables and green energy, which is an inspiration, I think, not only 
in the UK, but also across the world. Uh, and that's a powerful thing that they've managed to do that, that they're trying to do that, and not easy, you know, that they have to fight not only the oil um, lobby, but also um, the coal lobby, particularly in, 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 say, for example, West Virginia. And that's amazing that they've managed to push that through. And it's a powerful symbol. So what's happening in the US? The US is a beacon of possibility of what can be done, a beacon of the fight on this issue that can be done. And we need that beacon to light what we're doing here in the UK and help us doing it. Because as I said before, what's happening in the UK is not just a UK problem, it's an American problem, and it can be solved partly in America. Thank you for those uh, last positive uh, words and thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today, James. And just a reminder that wherever you are, you are very welcome to host a screening of the oil machine. Just contact us through the website for more details.